Alright, hi guys. Today you're going to watch a video. Don't complain too much. I cut it back from an hour down to around 15-20 minutes. I hope you enjoy it. Take care. April 12th, 1861. The Civil War had begun. A conflict that arose in part from Abraham Lincoln's dream of abolishing slavery. Now that the South had seceded, Lincoln seized the opportunity to pursue another dream, that of a railroad which would span the continent. The idea for a transcontinental railroad had been suggested as early as the 1830s, but real planning did not begin until the 1850s. Then, a little over a year after the start of the Civil War, Lincoln signed the Pacific Railroad Act. The act authorized private companies to build the Transcontinental Railroad, the Central Pacific in the West, and the Union Pacific in the East. These two entities competed for government money and land grants in a race to complete the most track. It was a huge undertaking that employed thousands and built up the vast, unpopulated interior of the country. When completed, it moved goods and people at unimagined speeds created government where none previously existed and propelled the United States to a position of prominence on the world stage. The Union Pacific built track from the Missouri River to the west, crossing through Nebraska and what is now Wyoming. In the process, it laid the framework for an entire state. Along the way, Instant towns popped up where the railroad stopped to establish a watering or refueling location. Some of these communities eventually became the Wyoming cities we know today. Others disappeared as quickly as they were built. By the fall of 1867, the Union Pacific had reached the present-day state line. This was the end of track. This was the beginning of Wyoming. After much haggling over the route of the Union Pacific, Chief Engineer and Surveyor Grenville Dodge proclaimed the 42nd parallel as the most direct and practical. It lay about 100 miles south of the path historically navigated by bison and Indians, mountain men and fur traders, Oregon Trail pioneers and Mormon emigrants. Dodge laid out as straight a line as possible, keeping it to no more than a 4% grade ensuring the steam locomotives could efficiently pull their cars. Dr. Thomas Durant, an organizer of the Union Pacific and a long-standing schemer and speculator, was often at odds with Dodge. He had no incentive to build a straight route. His company suggested lines that were often sweeping oxbow curves and other wasteful configurations to milk as much money from the federal government as possible and increase his own personal wealth. I think he's a, a pretty disreputable figure in the whole in the whole construction of the UP. Now, that's not to say that there weren't a thousand other Thomas Durants involved in the uh, in the Gilded Age during that time, because there were just essentially no business ethics at all, and uh, and there was no regulation of any of this stuff in those days either. The government paid the Union and Central Pacific in federal bonds at the rate of $16,000 per mile for flatland, $32,000 for foothills, and $48,000 for mountainous terrain. The two railroads also received substantial government land grants, a 400-foot right-of-way, and on either side of the tracks for 20 miles, the odd-numbered sections of 640 acres of land. Each section also included the mineral rights beneath the ground. The federal government retained the even-numbered sections in an effort to keep an eye on the railroad's business activities. 
The railroad used this land for building side tracks, depots, and other infrastructure. They also sold lots to land speculators and new settlers. But building the most track as quickly as possible was of paramount importance in the race with the Central Pacific. That first series of tracks across the country weren't built to last. Speed was of the essence. They needed to get the thing built. They had to throw down the ties, put on the rails, um, uh, hammer in the spikes, and they had to do it fast. This substandard construction, along with equipment failure and human error, sometimes led to disastrous consequences. These were the biggest and fastest machines ever built. When something went wrong, it often escalated into a massive accident involving derailment and lost lives. After a poor start from Omaha in 1865, in which only about 40 miles of track were laid, the firm of Jack and Dan Casement were hired in February 1866 to take charge of track laying. Short, stocky, and tough as nails, the two brothers were Civil War vets with track laying experience. As construction bosses, they quickly established a timetable and a no-nonsense work ethic that got the tracks moving westward. A year and a half later, they had spanned Nebraska and reached today's Wyoming border. But building a railroad wasn't just about track laying. A huge and varied labor force spread over the countryside, often hundreds of miles apart. I think uh, uh, T.A. Larson uh, put it best when he said that unlike a, a straight line of construction, uh, these railroad crews were more like beads on a string whether it be the surveyors out here in the front, and then right behind them would be the graders, and then a little bit further back would be the, the track layers. The surveyors labored in the western wilderness, laying out the exact line the railroad would take from Dodge's general route. The surveyors were, were in many cases, people who were uh, uh, former military officers. Uh, a lot of them had, uh, had learned uh, their surveying skills commercially in the, in the East prior to signing on with the UP. They lived like mountain men, working under the endless sky and living off abundant wild game, reveling in the freedom, the excitement, the danger of the wilderness. But many must have known this Western Eden would change forever once the railroad actually pushed through. The time is coming and fast too when in the sense it is now understood, there will be no West. Arthur N. Ferguson, Union Pacific Survey Party. In time, towns would sprout up, wild game would vanish, mountains and riverbanks would be stripped of trees, and Native Americans would be driven from their land. The railroad would usher in fundamental change to the West. But it would also bring prosperity. Farms and ranches, businesses and homesteads would begin to fill in the large, empty region between the two coasts, long mistaken as the Great American Desert and Lodgepole Creek drainages. He named it Sherman Pass after his friend and Civil War general, William Tecumseh Sherman. It's an area that today is known as the Gangplank. We are standing on the Great Plains as, we, as I stand right here. About 200 feet to my right is the Rocky Mountains. It's a very low area of the Rocky Mountains and we are on a very, very high area of the Great Plains. The Great Plains lead without a break onto the Rocky Mountains. They form a bridge, a bridge that is called the Gangplank. Had Dodge not discovered this location, this very narrow neck where the Great Plains meet the, the Rocky Mountains, 
it's highly likely that the railroad would not have come through here at all. As construction crews moved up the gangplank, they eventually topped out at over 8,000 feet. The Union Pacific Railroad had made the grade. It right here to beyond the uh, wall that you see over there on the other side, 708 feet, 125 feet from the creek bed uh, to the rail, uh, to the base of the rails. When the Dale Creek Bridge was finished on April 23, 1868, it was declared an engineering marvel. But those crossing it by train were less impressed with the accomplishment and more concerned for their own safety. This trestle bridge looks like a light, frail thing to bear so great weight. But fears are not expressed because of the frail appearance of the bridge, but in regard to the tempest of wind, so fierce that we fear the cars may be blown from the track. In the providence of God, the wind decreased. Its terrible wail is subdued to pitiful sobs and sighs, and we passed safely over the dreaded bridge. Ellen G. White. Like so much of the hastily built Union Pacific Railroad, Dale Creek Trestle was replaced several times over the ensuing years. And when the railroad relocated the line in 1901, the last Dale Creek Bridge was removed. We looked at it from a high ridge. Far off, it was very small, but it kept coming and growing larger all the time, puffing out smoke and steam. And as it came on, we said to each other that it looked like a white man's pipe when he was smoking. Porcupine, warrior of the Northern Cheyenne. The federal government encouraged native people to allow the railroad across their traditional lands by signing the Fort Laramie Treaty in 1868. Nevertheless, a few marauding bands still caused problems. A few days ago, four men were shot by the Indians and were brought into this post. One of them died from the effects of his wounds. Last night and during today, the soldiers have been digging his grave. Another of the wounded men I hear is not expected to live. Arthur N. Ferguson, Union Pacific Survey Party. As treaty after treaty were broken, the tribes began defending what they still had left. Europeans and the Plains tribes, the Sioux and Cheyenne, the Arapaho and Shoshone, were on a collision course. It was a cataclysmic clash of two different mindsets, worldviews, the whole notion of economy. They were at diametrically, uh, they were at di diametrical odds with one another. Tribal people did not recognize that these newcomers would address them in a multifaceted approach, meaning treaties first, recognizing that everything will be done in a good way. The second, a military intervention. Third, a violation of treaties by all the newcomers. Fourth, and here where the condition of modernity plays a role, the steel horse, as I used to call it, came across their lands. We will build iron roads, and you cannot stop the locomotive any more than you can stop the sun or the moon. And you must submit and do the best you can. General William Tecumseh Sherman. The railroad men have an infallible remedy for the Indian troubles. That remedy is extermination. The Chicago Tribune. It has been estimated that the West held as many as 15 to 60 million buffalo at the arrival of the Europeans. This number was severely depleted partially as a result of the Transcontinental Railroad. What had happened with the arrival of the steel horse was it divided the herds, the American bison, and along with the division of the herds became the decimation of the herds by hunters who were providing food originally for the workers, but then it became just a big sport. This wholesale slaughter crushed the Indian insurgency as it broke their hearts and their culture. Once the bison were removed, decimated if I may, uh, the marginalizing of Native America on reservations. All the while, the Iron Horse, the Union Pacific, continued to move across the West. In the end, the Union Pacific had laid 1,087 miles of track, 
The Central Pacific, 690 miles of track. The Union Pacific had won the race. Taken as a whole, the Transcontinental Railroad was the greatest engineering feat of the 19th century. It was transformational. A journey that used to take months could now be traveled in mere days. A new world was dawning. Time and distance had shrunk, and America was moving into a bold new future.